and you're not going to satisfy everybody. So today's topic, my goal is not to please anyone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And to discuss the reality of some of the quote-unquote jihadist movements of the 20th century, i.e. the last hundred years or so. And this topic is especially relevant and especially emotionally charged in light of all of the transgressions that are taking place in the Muslim world. We see so many governments, we see so many powers attacking Muslim lands. We see so much oppression and dhulm, injustice. And someone seems to stand up and fight against that injustice. And therefore it is natural that our sympathies with, are sometimes with those who are fighting against oppression. Our sympathies are sometimes with those who are fighting against injustice. But the fact of the matter is that it is possible, it is possible to fall into injustice even as you fight against injustice. And the wise person is the one who can point out the problems, the inconsistencies of both methodologies while remaining firm to the truth. In our religion, just because you're a Muslim doesn't mean everything you do becomes legitimate and right. In our religion, just because you say La ilaha illallah, it doesn't justify everything that you're doing. And if someone points out some mistakes of Muslims, this does not mean that they're siding with those who are opposing Allah and His Messenger. This does not mean that they are siding with unjust regimes, with tyrannical governments, with foreign policies that have suffocated Muslim lands. Not at all. Rather, we are pointing out that if you want to fight against oppression, you want to fight against injustice, then the best way to do it is the most effective and the most Islamically legitimate. Both things have to be taken into account. What is Islamically allowed and what is not allowed. And I also want to make a very important disclaimer here that this talk has nothing to do with our brothers and sisters who are fighting against oppression directly. This talk is not aimed to, let's say, Syria and our brothers in Syria that are fighting against the regime. I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about people who, and my criticisms in today's talk, are going to be about people who are targeting those who have nothing to do with injustice. They're targeting those who are, we would call them in modern language, civilians or non-combatants. The, the talk here is for those Muslims who are sympathetic to organizations, sympathetic to people, sympathetic to trends that are indiscriminately killing everybody. Obviously, whether you're Muslim or not, if, you're, if your land is attacked, your country is attacked, your home is attacked, you have the right to defend. And our brothers and sisters in Syria, for example, when the regime is doing what it is doing, where I'm not talking about them in particular. No, I'm talking generically, especially for those of us living in the West who might, some of us might be sympathetic to trends, to movements that we assume are battling these evils, but sometimes they fall into evils, sometimes they fall into greater evils. And I'm going to try to be as generic as possible and I want the maxim I want us to learn and to memorize is those who ignore history are doomed to repeat it. Very simple. Those who ignore history are doomed to repeat it. Do you think this is the first time that the ummah is facing injustices in the world? Do you think that this is the first time that there's been a crisis? Do you think this is the first time that the banner of jihad has been raised? Do you think this is the first time oppression is being challenged? Of course not. So why don't we look back and see at other movements 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 30 years ago that also attempted to challenge injustice. And we can now analyze their mistakes and make sure that we don't fall into the same mistakes as we battle against injustice. Brothers and sisters, to be explicit and crystal clear, we all know that the root cause of quote-unquote Islamic terrorism, the root cause of Islamic terrorism is the legitimate political grievances that these people have. We're all angry at the Palestinian crisis. All of us are bleeding for what is happening in Palestine. We're infumed, we're infuriated at how so many countries are 
treating our Muslim brothers and sisters. So the question is not whether the West is doing an injustice in Palestine. The question is not whether you know the Israeli conflict is this and that, or the question is not whether the, the, the foreign policy of Afghanistan, the drone attacks, we are all opposed to the false invasion of Iraq. We're all opposed to the indiscriminate killing uh, of, of our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan. The question is, what do you do here in Norway? What do I do in America? What is our response to that violence, to that zulm, to that injustice? Should we follow the path of those clerics and those people who preach, oh, we have to wage jihad against everybody in the world? All of Norway, because they have, I don't know, five peace tro tro peacekeeping troops or 20 somewhere in the world, all of Norway becomes guilty. In America, we have such people that they say, oh, because of the drone attacks in, in, in Afghanistan, we can bomb New York City. And they say an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And this is their mentality. I am criticizing this mentality. I want to be explicit here. Let nobody ask a ridiculous question at the end. I am not talking about our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan attacking those who are attacking them. I'm not talking about our brothers and sisters in Palestine, in Kashmir, fighting against the troops that are killing them. Of course, every human being in the world, when his family, when his children are attacked, when they're deprived of basic rights, of course they're going to stand up and fight back. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about me and you right here in Oslo, in America, in New York, in, in Houston where I'm born and raised. Do we just go and start killing people? The Boston bombers. This is what I'm talking about. The bombers in Boston, they were Muslim. They claim to be Muslim. We don't deny their Islam because of this deed. Was that deed legitimate or not? That is the question I'm talking about. I am not talking once again about Afghans defending their land against troops that have invaded. That's a separate issue, separate topic, nothing to do with my topic today. So I want to be very clear here. The topic here is the indiscriminate killing of non-combatants, of civilians, of peoples in lands that by and large are not aware and are not involved of what is happening in foreign places. And I began this talk by talking about some of the uh, characteristics of the first group in Islam that I would say exhibited extremist tendencies. And this group is the famous group of the Kharijites. This group is the famous group of the Kharijites. Now, for those of you who have never heard of this group, the Kharijites were the first splinter group in Islam. And they broke away from the Muslim community at the time of Ali ibn Abi Talib, the fourth caliph. When Ali and Muawiyah were having a war based on politics, not based on religion, and they disagreed based on politics, to save the ummah and not have another war, both Ali and Muawiyah agreed to a truce, to a ceasefire. The both of them are companions. The both of them understood this is not wise. So they agreed to a truce. They said, let's stop fighting. Let's negotiate the way forward. These group that were later called Kharijites said that this is wrong. The fact that you've agreed to a ceasefire is wrong. Because, oh Ali, if you're on the truth, you have to kill the very last end of the other troop and finish him all off. And if you're not upon the truth, well then, you shouldn't have been fighting and the other group should win over you. In other words, they saw the world as black and white. Remember this point. They saw the world as black and white. You're either with us or against us fully. There's no in-between. You're either fully upon the truth or else you're completely wrong and there's no middle ground. And they broke away. And this group known as the Kharijites, our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he predicted of them. And he gave us some characteristics about them. Now, these characteristics, listen to me carefully again. These characteristics by and large are still found in many of the quote-unquote radical jihadist groups to, in our times. Groups such as Al-Qaeda, groups such as the ISIS, we find these characteristics in them. Listen to me and listen to your Prophet Muhammad وسلم, with an open mind. And then you see for yourself, do these characteristics exist in these groups or not? What did our Prophet وسلم, say about the Kharijites? These hadith are in uh, many of the books of, of, of hadith. The first one I'm going to quote you is the hadith of Abu Dawood. That our Prophet وسلم, said, There will be differences in my ummah. And a group of people, يُحْسِنُونَ الْقِيلِ وَيُسِيُونَ الْفَأْلِ 
They speak this talk. They have good speech, but their actions are terrible, will appear. So notice the first characteristic. What they're calling to, what they're saying is beautiful. What they're doing is downright evil. This is what our Prophet ﷺ said. يحسنون القيل They know how to talk. Their call is great. You cannot disagree with it. وَيُسِيُونَ الْفِعْلِ The actions they're doing are terrible. And they shall recite the Qur'an, but they will not, it will not leave their throats. Meaning, they seem to be pious, but they're not acting upon the Qur'an. They shall depart from this religion like an arrow goes through its prey. Like an, when you shoot an arrow, it goes through a deer. Like it goes through the deer, that's how they're going to leave this religion. They are calling to the book of Allah, but they have nothing to do with the book of Allah. So this is the first character, the first hadith, excuse me. They're calling to the book of Allah, but they have nothing to do with the uh, book of Allah. And in the famous hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, the, the, a man came to the Prophet ﷺ with a huge thick beard, a wide forehead, and shaved hair. And the Prophet ﷺ was in the battle of Hunayn, he was giving the booty and the spoils of war to various people. This man came up and said, Ya Muhammad, astaghfirullah, this is how he's addressing the Prophet ﷺ. He's a Muslim, so supposedly, he's addressing, Ya Muhammad qismah. Fear Allah and be just in distributing this money, meaning I want more than what you gave me. Fear Allah and be just in distributing this money. Our Prophet ﷺ said, Wayhak, woe to you. Who else will fear Allah and be just if I am not fearing Allah and being just? If I will not fear Allah and be just, who else on this earth is going to fear Allah and be just? And some of the Sahaba became so angry and incensed, they wanted to execute him. And the Prophet said, no, let him be. Don't, don't, don't execute him. But from this man's mentality will come. From this man's mentality will come a group of people. You shall consider your worship and your prayer and your recitation of the Quran to be nothing compared to theirs. I.e., outwardly they're overzealous and overpious. But they shall leave this religion like an arrow leaves its prey. In another hadith, also in Sahih Muslim, our Prophet wasallam said, there will come during the end of time. So now this, he's talking about groups in our times, towards the end of times. A group of people, now listen to this now, memorize this description. Hudatha'ul asnan, sufaha'ul ahlam, yaquluna min khayri qawl al Three characteristics. Number one, hudatha'ul asnan, young men. Young, they're not old, they're not wise, they're not experienced, they're a bunch of kids. Hudathaul Asnan. Sufahaul Ahlam. They have the most grandiose visions. They're dreaming the biggest dreams. Yaquluna min khayri qawl al They are speaking the best speech that you've ever heard of any man. But they will leave Islam like an arrow leaves its prey. In all of these ahadith, these groups are being described as leaving Islam and they're being described as speaking good, painting a beautiful picture, but doing deeds of evil. And this is the problem that many people, when they listen to these groups, the speech is great. It's incendiary, it's moving, it's powerful, championing the rights of the oppressed. But then you see the damage that they've done, the innocent lives that they've killed, the blood that they have shed. And it is difficult to connect that image with this image. And this is what our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is saying. That you shall consider their prayers trivial compared to your prayers trivial compared to theirs. So these people are reading the Quran. They're saying the most beautiful speech. They're calling to the book of Allah, but there's something wrong with them. What is wrong with them? They're causing bloodshed violence, their actions, their deeds are not supportive of the Qur'an. Therefore, historically speaking, historically speaking, the Kharijites of old were the most eager to accuse other Muslims of nifaq, of hypocrisy, of kufr. They were the most eager to shed the blood of other Muslims. They were the most eager to fight other Muslims. My 